Okay. Um, hi there, Peter. Nice to uh, nice to see you again. Long time no see. It's Tuesday yeah. morning, wasn't it? Yeah. Um, so um, I think we got um, we, we got on to talking about you, you mentioned about the fact that you'd uh, obviously um, had a, a desire to play uh, bass guitar, but you, you you play a lot of other instruments as well. And when I asked you about you know me being a product of the exam system, you said, well, yes, you you also went through the ABRSM grades but it was on yep. clarinet yeah so, so i'm interesting i'm interested to hear how you how you got into playing the the clarinet yeah well i i was at the harris academy in dundee and it, it, if you were in england it would be probably described as a grammar school the, the right. teachers were absolutely fantastic mm -hmm. and um the for example in first year they uh, one of the music department came round and asked, it was the first thing, it, does anyone play any musical instruments? Yes. So I stuck my hand up uh, along with another one or two persons. And uh, they said, um, if you wish, you can come and get an addition from the clarinet tutor and the head of music. So I went and got an addition and uh, ended up, they gave me a clarinet, believe it or not. They lent me a clarinet until my dad bought me one. Yeah. And they gave me free clarinet lessons, which was yeah. absolutely fantastic. You know, really wonderful. Yep. And I went on to play with the, the school orchestra and um, the Dundee Schools Orchestra and the Dundee, uh, the concert band, they called it. It was like a military band, Paul. You know, so I was yep. playing, uh, you know, the clarinet in that band. And after that, I mentioned to you, I had a band that was formed from friends of mine at school and I would take uh, my clarinet out and play all the sort of modern things uh, of the day, like Acker Bilk stuff and, you know, that kind of stuff on clarinet. And, but that was, that was all, that was as far as I really got with that kind of thing. You know, I used to practice sort of uh, swing solos and this kind of thing at home, but I didn't actually play them out. So that was a uh, clarinet I, I played. That's, that's interesting. My my I remember my my eldest cousin uh, Kevin. He played uh, clarinet, and my dad accordion, and they did duets together at various concerts. And I, I distinctly remember them doing things like La Vie en Rose and uh, La Mer. But for me, uh -huh. the, the the clarinet. As soon as you mention clarinet, I immediately hear the first uh, first um, cadenza, opening cadenza of Rhapsody in Blue. Oh yeah, that wonderful slide at the beginning. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Fantastic, absolutely beautiful. Never, never, never got around to playing it other than uh, trying bits of it, you know. But uh... at at the school as well, I was really blessed because. I got, as soon as you start taking higher music naturally, you've got to have two instruments. Yes. So my two, my two instruments were clarinet. And um, because I was a keyboard player, um, they they didn't do accordion as an instrument, which yeah. they will allow you to do now. Yes. So I did, I did piano and I was taught by this concert pianist. His name was Dr. Baldwin. I don't know if that he toured under that but this guy was an absolutely phenomenal teacher was fantastic you know and i studied uh, mostly greek and uh let me see now chopin um beethoven and uh, some mozart you know th that's what he really did to build technique and that so i was very very fortunate in that at the school it's really great yes we were discussing uh, as well about the um when the uh you know, the rest of the world discovered how the uh, Russian concert pianists had developed their technique so quickly. You know, it was um, it was it was all down to the uh, the Hananak exercises. Actually, I remember yep. I used to have to do the um, uh, the, the, the what, what was it book uh, by Otto Bus Bukowski? Oh, uh, the Cherny studies, Carl Cherny studies. Oh, yep. oh dear, oh dear. <laughs> There's a good one to add to anyone's profile. That's uh, uh, Jeffrey Tankard, the Tankard scales. The, the, these are uh, concert pianist uh, scales, which are very effective, really good. It's so interesting. <laughs> yes, sorry, I was going to say, when, 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 I, when I did like my um, two diplomas on the accordion with, with the BCA, uh, my, my, my dad then wrote out um, on some manuscript paper, 
he wrote out a few exercises and said, look, you know, um, you've, you've learned all the scales on the, on the accordion that you can do, you know, the uh, various arpeggios. But he said, these, these are the ones that you really want to focus on. And, and it was things like um, uh, E-flat major first inversion, because you can do it over three octaves. G, right. G, G diminished. Um, it was um, an E flat seventh, um, and, and all these things that that, that, that he that he, yep. that he wrote down. And it was like, you know, these are the ones that are the particularly E flat awkward, isn't it? Because you're you're going blind under the E flat onto the G every time. Yep. And uh, that, that that made a huge difference. But it was just it was just interesting how you know uh, you know at, at some point. You, you've sort of done all the scales and, and you're really trying to find the ones that are that are sort of that are going to help you most of all aren't you yep yeah and yeah. <coughs> carry on sorry so i was gonna yeah i was gonna say um so can you remember what age you were when you started accordion as opposed to the other instruments that you've done yeah i was eight so so putting them into some sort of chronological order then because Yep, uh, I was eight when I started accordion. I was, um, let me think now. I was um, 13 when I started clarinet. I was 14 when I started piano. Mm -hmm. I was, uh, I think, late 16s going on to 17 when I started playing bass. Right. And I, I taught myself guitar at the same time and then I taught myself sax. Yep. And you know, that, that was uh, about the, the lot regarding me taking these instruments up. <clears throat> when I first moved up to Aberdeen, I started my, my eldest son on piano, and I used to go to this man, Mr. Smith, and he taught me a uh, double bass. You know, I, my, my son did a half hour lesson, and I did, I, I was already a, a bass player. I was playing in this uh, big band in the Palace Ballroom. You know, there was 10 of us, a fantastic band. So, you know, I was a sort of sight reader on bass, but this guy showed me proper bowing technique, proper fingering technique. And you're a bass player, you'll know that uh, most of the bass guitar stuff you do is across the neck. Yeah. Well, this guy had me playing up and down the neck, you know, in yes. the proper position and this yes. kind of thing. And it was kind of alien to begin with, you know, because I was thinking, why not play across? Yeah. And eventually when I started playing actual double bass, I used to play across there as well. It would be totally frowned upon in, in proper circles, but that's how you can get by, you know, make it like the bass guitar technique, you know? So that was about the chronological situation of me taking up instruments, if you wish. That's, that's interesting. Again, parallels here with, with myself, because I, I was seven, nearly eight, when I started accordion on a little accordion. By about yeah. 12, my dad had started me on guitar, classical guitar, um, mm -hmm. and, and, and piano just sort of naturally followed. Um, and, and then... Um, I'm trying to think when I first started playing bass seriously. Probably wasn't until I came up to Scotland, but uh, you know, I'd, I'd always had uh, you know bass guitars and electric guitars, acoustic guitars around. Um, but the um, you know the, the, the clarinets, the, the saxophone was that kind of a natural progression. You just like the sound of the sax. Yeah, yeah, I really liked that. I mean, latterly, I, I, I stopped playing bass guitar in groups about mid nineties. And started playing, you know, a couple of keyboards, sax, and you know, I'd always sung in bands and and singing. And until I sort of retired forcibly after my third heart attack a couple of years ago, uh, I was uh, doing that, you know, keyboards, um, sax, and and singing. And I really enjoyed that. It was really pretty good fun. Yeah. And you might be able to help me with this. I understand that the 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 sax um, fingering is a, a penny whistle. Uh, no, sorry. My apologies, recorder. I think it's recorder fingering for the sax, which that should encourage young people who didn't know that to take up the sax if they're good recorder players. I must admit, I, I really don't know much about the, um, uh, the fingering for the saxophone, other than the fact that um, my um, other, other cousin, the, <laughs> the Kevin, Kevin was the oldest of, of the Hunt Underhill boys, um, and then the um, third, third, third in age, Ian, he he tried a variety of instruments, violin, piano, until he he took up the saxophone. And and I remember when I, mean, I moved back down to Cheltenham for a year and a half, he needed somebody to accompany accompany him on piano for the uh, 
He wanted the exams. To do his, he wanted to do his ABR7 grade eight jazz saxophone exam. So I was yep. his accompanist, but also oh. I was I was the guy that had to um, so to the figure out what the syllabus was actually demanding. So so on 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 the scales, for example, you start on the tonic. And whatever key you're in, you go to whatever the highest available note is on the saxophone. You then come all the way back down to whatever the lowest note available in that scale is and back to the tonic. And, and I was I was really chuffed when uh, when we went somewhere near Birmingham for this uh, for this grade eight exam. And the local rep had got his candidates sort of warming up in the room, you know, and, yep. and, and, and he heard Ian going in and doing his scales. And he just turned to the rest of the room and said, that's how you play the scales. <laughs> <laughs> the good news about the sax is that uh, the, the, the lower octave and the, the middle octave, if you wish, are the, exactly the same fingering. You don't have what we call on the clarinet a speaker key. You have an octave key. Yeah. So it's far simpler in that respect. You know, you've got far... Uh, less complicated fingerings, especially going over the bridge and that kind of thing on clarinet. Yeah. The, the saxophone, I, I think, is a, a far more straightforward instrument. The only thing with the sax is getting a good sound out of it. Yes. Because, you know, if you listen to the top players, they get a wonderful sound. Oh, that I've... requires tremendous practice and, you know, yes. getting the correct shape, your correct embouchure. And, and really important is, as far as I'm concerned, is getting a good mouthpiece mm. and, and, and a good ligature. Too, yeah. that, that can completely change the sound you get, you know. So yeah. it's a wee bit technical, but a wonderful, wonderful instrument. Really yeah. great. He, he yeah. actually um, he struggled in the exam. He, he said he struggled to get the uh, intonation to, because he thought that that the piano was a bit flat, and he was struggling to get himself down as low. And and he came out the room and he and he was like really disappointed. We like stopped at a pub and I and I said to him, look, look, Ian, you know, I said. I said, I'm not going to listen to any more of your nonsense, right? I'm going to wait until I see the, the exam result and see what you actually got score-wise. He got 137 out of 150. Oh, Pass fantastic. distinction. And, and I, I, can, I can still remember the two tunes that we did were Body and Soul, the John Coltrane solo, and Desafinado, the Stan Getz solo. Yeah. Uh, absolutely yeah. superb stuff to, to play. And, uh, he, he still plays. He, he went on to do... Um, I think he went on to, to Leeds Jazz College and uh, learned a lot there. Yep. Um, and then, uh, two, one, <coughs> yeah. Sorry, I was going to say one or two of my pupils uh, went on to Leeds. Yeah. You know, one of my bass players and one of my uh, uh, guitar players. And, you know, I've had guitar players and bass players going on to Brighton as well. Brighton yeah. is a tremendous place, you know, for yeah. modern uh, sort of instruments, you know? Yes, yeah. And, and, um, and so, so um, one of the reasons I, my dad asked me to take up guitar was, was actually purely from the point of view that he wanted me to teach and he wanted me to teach his guitar classes because he'd got that uh -huh. much demand man for lessons. And, and so I, I would say I, I first started teaching, um, actually, you know, sort of getting paid for it at the age of 13. My good. Yeah, yeah, I know. It was, it was, uh, it was quite. I mean, but by thirteen, I what had I done? I I did an exam every year, apart from I went from grade one to grade two in like um, it was about three months or so. So I so I kind of skipped a year. So eight, eight, I was at least grade five or six, and and so so therefore my dad said, you know. Uh, you can, you know, you can have some, some of, some of the pupils that I can't fit in, kind of thing, you know. And, yep. Uh, it, it worked, it worked fine. I, uh, I had my own little, little room as, as well in the house, in which. Did, but when, when did you start um, the, the teaching? Well, teaching actually, I, I mentioned to you about uh, my, my band that was formed from school friends, mm -hmm. and eventually the, the other three out of our four-piece band disappeared, and they were replaced uh, on guitar. Uh, and singing, we had a guy called Gordon Cumming, and on drums, a guy called uh, Trevor Williamson, and um, the organ player, they were all fine players, very good musicians, was a guy called Gordon Nixon, and his brother was uh, a guy called Sandy Nixon, oh, who eventually had his own band and this kind of thing, and before, this was at uh, the end of the 
the 60s, I started teaching Sandy. He was already getting lessons from a fine teacher, a, a guy called Jim Marshall. But I gave him, if you like, some supplementary uh, advice and also taught him uh, a, a few of the tunes that uh, Jim Money taught me, you know, these uh, Italian arrangements and this kind of thing. And, you know, it, it brought home what you've got to be able to do as a teacher. First thing I think is that you've got to be competent. You've got to know what you're talking about. So I was teaching him the second movement of this was the, the Light Cavalry Overture. And the second movement actually has, uh, it's 2-4, and it has triplets in the right hand and straight quavers in the left hand. So unfortunately, I'd um, learnt it incorrectly when I was studying it. And in the right hand's going bump, 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 uh, and the left hand's going dump, 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 dump. And I was getting the left hand to go bump, bump, bump uh, in time. And he said, now, can you explain something to me? Why am I playing the basses at the same time as the first and the third quaver. He was a really highly intelligent young man. He was only about 11 or 12, about 11 at the time, I think. And I looked and said, oh. <laughs> and I said, I must apologize. And it was the most humiliating experience, an 11 year old telling you, you don't know what you're talking about. You know, so that was that was the first lesson that I thought I learned uh, there. So that was, how old, how old would I be? Maybe 21, 22, something like that. And then I stopped teaching altogether because I started, to, I went to Aberdeen to join Hydroelectric as a trainee programmer. And they put me down to London University to study computing. And um, I didn't teach for another couple of years. And uh, this guy phoned me up from the Clydesdale Music Shop, just up Union Street. I used to live uh, in uh, Union Road beside Union Street. And he said, I've heard that you're an accordion player. I wonder if you can help me. I've got a, a shop that's stocked with accordions. People come in, they want their children to, to learn, but they don't have any teachers. I wonder if you can help me. There's two persons who will definitely buy accordions from me if you'll teach them. Yeah. And I said, oh, oh my goodness, okay. I, I said, I'll come down and I'll have a look and see what the situation is. Now, believe it or not, the only place he had was the storeroom. So I had taught these two children in one evening, you know, one of them at uh, six o'clock and one of them at 6.30, because I went off to play with uh, the Peter D Orchestra at the Palace Ballroom, you know, at uh, eight o'clock we had to be in. So um, that's how I got started. And then it followed from there because I put them in for Perth. This was after about a year-ish. And one of them won the under 10s and the other one won the under 12s section there. And I started getting phone calls from people who came in. Now, interestingly, one of the first persons was a guy called Graham Mitchell. I don't know, you know, he's, he's very famous up yes, here. Yeah. A wonderful player and band leader and goodness knows what else he's done and, and a composer. Yes. His father phoned. He there was a big article in the Aberdeen papers about these two children who'd won. Who'd won. There was this girl, Gillian Conn. She was from Stonehaven, and uh, Kevin Sinclair was the guy who won the under tens, and he was from Aberdeen. So they, had, they did this big expose, if you wish, of accordionists and this kind of thing. And they didn't uh, interview me, but they mentioned my name, and Graham Mitchell's father phoned the. the he got the names of one of the pupils and they got my phone number and he asked if I would start teaching Graham. So Graham started uh, coming in from, he lived in the Huntley area and he started coming in. And then when he started uh, winning competitions and that, I started getting lots and lots of inquiries uh, from people up in that area, from Keith, Huntley, all over the, the, the Northeast really. And then Aberdeen people, uh, I started teaching a guy called Graham Geddes I uh, started teaching him, I think it was 83, something like 82, 83. I started teaching Graham and it, it sort of snowballed from then, you know, on, on accordion. And I then went on to teach uh, some really very, very clever uh, young children and that kind of thing. So I was very fortunate. So that's how I got started, Paul, you know, yeah. teaching. And, and, and we'll get on to your um, uh, sort of um, the... Uh, What's the word I'm looking for? Progeny, I suppose, is the word I'm looking for. Um, you, you've actually taught um, people who have become teachers themselves that have 
produce some very fine players, and we'll, we'll get onto that in a wee while. Um, so, so at the at the accordion competitions when you first started entering pupils, particularly for example, for the you know March Strass Bay Real section, um, what sort of materials were you using? Was it a lot of Scott Skinner? Yeah, Scott Skinner. I mean, the the set of stuff that I was uh, playing. I, I, I always used to play a Scott Skinner march, and my favourite was one that wasn't played because it was a wee bit tricky, but not nearly as tricky as the stuff that these young children are playing nowadays. They're absolutely phenomenal techniques. Uh, sorry, they have phenomenal techniques. Um, this was uh, it was the Duke of Fife's Welcome to the D side, and that the 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 this, the variation of that is just a little bit tricky, but absolutely nothing compared to. Um, the stuff that they were doing and I used to teach a lot of Skinner when I started teaching mm -hmm. because I, I thought that well it, it, melodic you know wonderfully melodic and it, you know the harmonies that were written for example in the harp and claymore were very very uh, basic you know mm, yes but the, with sort of greater knowledge of this kind of thing you know the teachers and and uh, young uh, accordions and that started to write uh, more subtle harmonies and uh, fantastic really wonderful music Scott Skinner uh, I, yeah. I can't say enough about him really wonderful I must, I must admit I was I was that that impressed with the Scott Skinner with the, the yellow Scottish violinist book when, when I first got it I actually yep. the, the very first book I ever got published was at my arrangements of Scott Skinner tunes Ah, okay. and and I, I remember once I had a pupil that stayed in York Place in Edinburgh and uh, it was it was Hardy Press that were the distributors for the book, and he'd been on holiday in America, Seattle. He went in a music shop and picked up my my Scott Skinner collection, you know. So it was it was brilliant. But um, I might thinking that back in his days, you know, Scott Skinner was 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 found upon by some people as being, you know, it's it's too fancy, it's too complex. I mean, King Robert the Bruce. I mean, it's 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 hellish on the accordion, but it can't be that much fun on the violin either, can it? <laughs> no, that that's the thing. Anything new, people don't like it. Yep. Because it takes them out of their comfort zone, especially when uh, my music started to get played and this kind of thing. The reason I wrote these tunes really is because they didn't sound like anything else that was going around. Yes. And you know, for example, nowadays uh, there must be I don't know a million. Uh, pentatonic Irish reels going about and they're all brilliant tunes, catchy and that kind of thing. So I couldn't possibly write, uh, well, I do write tunes to myself and write them on manuscript and stick them away in a folder and that kind of thing. But I couldn't possibly write um, these uh, pentatonic uh, minor reels and, you know, because it would be just like everyone else was doing it, yeah. you know? It just, uh, I, I don't know, that's, that's the thing. But anything new, I think people balk at that kind of thing because for example, I, there was this meeting that was called uh, down in Perth once people started playing all this the kind of stuff that I was putting out. And mostly the uh, competitions were adjudicated by band leaders who were absolute geniuses at what they did. You know, they, they had wonderful bands that really inspired people to dance and this kind of thing. But they didn't know what to do when it came to adjudicating this kind of tune. I mean, did they say that this is not accordion music, this is just a lot of old baloney or what? And they invited me to attend, so I turned up and nobody had ever seen me before. And so I, I, I came in and uh, they said, hello, who are you? And I said, I am he that uh, put this curse upon you, really. And they said, well, you know, how should we go about doing this? And I said, well, basically, if somebody plays uh, a reel and it doesn't sound like a Scottish reel. It doesn't have the, you know, the, the technical requirements or, you know, it doesn't have the characteristics that you would expect when someone's playing that. I said, mark them down, you know, just don't, don't let them win these competitions. And eventually I think that they were completely overwhelmed by the amount of people that started playing this kind of stuff because it, it displayed your technique. That was it basically. So you could find out who was technically the best, but the people who were who were, were winning were the guys who could actually make them sound like Scottish pieces. And, you know, I, I said to them at the time, I mean, if you give my music to John Hewitt and ask him to play it, he'll make it sound like Scottish pieces. 
You know, so that was that was all I, mean, I said. I, I mean, I mean, serious, seriously, what 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 bit of that did they not understand? <laughs> I, I, it is. It, it, it's, it's a fearful amount of dots on a page, isn't it? Well, I don't know. I don't know what you're holding up. It's, it's your book. Oh, with, yeah. with your yeah. first tune. First tune is, uh, yeah, What Do You Get Is, March. I think, I think I'm, I'm, um, I think I'm. think that's still played by, by quite a few people. It is. Now, actually, nowadays, I, heard, you know? I, I heard a recording of uh, Perth last year and someone was playing that, I think. But there you go. <laughs> <laughs> and then after that, I, after that, I went on to teach goodness knows how many people, mostly from the northeast area. And, you know, down south, I had people coming in from Inverness, all over the north of Scotland, and started to record one or two uh, people. For example, Graham Mitchell won the senior Perth, I think it was in 77. And then he was followed by a guy that lived a few miles from him, a guy called Eric Bell. He won in 78. And if, uh, I think, well, the guy you mentioned that was a, a really great teacher it was a guy called John Bone that I taught. He was a, a, a senior champion and he taught um, Craig Payton. Yes. Now, there's a connection with me with Craig Payton. My uh, granddaughter's fiance, uh, uh, Ollie, is Craig ba Payton's best friend. And Craig Payton's going to be his uh, best man next year when they become married. Excellent. So that's a, a silly, uh, uh, if you wish, connection there. Yeah. But yeah, I, I did myself the dirty because there's at least, well, at least a dozen of my pupils I know who teach now and nobody bothers to, well, nobody came to me for the last 20 years, really. So <laughs> but, um, that's a lot of Yeah. But you, but you were saying that um, this jo John Bone? Yep. Yeah. You, you, you were telling me a funny story about him competing at a competition and they, they wanted to exclude him? Oh, yeah. This was a horribly, horribly, horribly embarrassing situation that I encountered because I was sitting adjudicating and I just finished listening to this performance, fine performance. And what I used to do was to do scribbled notes on a bit of scrap paper and then enter that up properly yeah. onto their adjudication sheet. Now he suddenly comes in the hall and marches right up to where I am and starts talking to me. And I said, John, I, I'm sorry, I can't. He says, no, you'll have to. He said, because what's happened is I was practicing in this uh, rehearsal room, you know, around yeah. the back of yeah. uh, the stage at the, the city hall. And he said, they called out my name and I wasn't there. So they've, they've, come, they've, they've taken me out of the competition altogether. Now I mentioned to you in our last interview how the, the, the fact that I would never ever do that. If someone wasn't available, they'd be found and then you'd let them play at the end. But they didn't Absolutely. do that, they excluded them from playing. And he was completely distraught because we'd been working for months on his tunes to get them absolutely perfect. And he was playing wonderfully. And he was almost in tears, you know. And I said, John, please, I can't talk to you just now. And he said, but you'll have to help me because otherwise... <laughs> anyway, the long and short of it was, I forgot to transcribe my notes onto this adjudication sheet because I had to ring the bell for the next pupil. So at the end of this adjudication, this guy came up, obviously the teacher, and showed me this adjudication sheet with nothing written on it. I'd, I'd put in the mark, but I hadn't transcribed. And it was the most embarrassing experience of my whole life. I was almost... I don't know. I, I couldn't say anything to the guy. What I should have done is gone through my, you know, notes that my, and then presented the, the information to them then. But that was a horrible experience, you know. And so anyway, that, that was that was John Bone for you. You know, he's a dedicated practicer, unfortunately. Uh, well, yeah, that's a great story. I mean, the... Um, I'm certainly at most of the competitions I've been to, they, they have people that, that regularly go round and in effect round up the ones that are going to be competing in, in, the, in the particular section that they are announcing. And it, it all works, all works pretty well. But of course, at one point, you had so many competitors. I, I remember once um, the meeting, Silver Pasby outside the salutation because they had the, the hall and then they had the salutation hotel for some of the exams. And, it, yep. and, and from nine o'clock in the morning till 11 o'clock, 
he had listened to 70, 70 odd people playing <laughs> playing playing Francis Wright's Francesca Waltz. I had an even worse experience than that. I went down, I was invited to, to, to adjudicate at the West of Scotland Championship, you know, and this was all kinds of stuff. And it was a sort of senior Scottish, junior Scottish, and there was this sort of uh, young person Scottish. So I thought it was going to be a Mark Strasby and real. And what, the, what all of these 45 uh, uh, wee bairns were playing was uh, a waltz. It was something, I think it was a 32 bar waltz, the simplest tune in the world. Now, how do you separate 45 persons with a, a 32 bar waltz? And everyone was getting the tune right. And how I did it, this was the only thing I could do. There was an anacrusis at the beginning and all the phrasing led from that anacrusis. So you got pa pa pum and then all of the rest of the phrasing was pa pa pum Pum. In other words, if you were singing it, you'd be yes. taking a breath before that and yep. your bellows changes and that kind of thing. Well, 95% of them weren't doing that. They were changing at the beginning of the bar instead of the, the, yeah. the reflected uh, anacrusis. And eventually I managed to get that down to three persons who were phrasing it properly. And I, I tried to explain that. But then you got people come and say, we Jimmy, you never made any mistakes. Why did you know when? Yeah. It was about 25 of them said, I said, and I said, never again, you know, will I ever do that unless I check what I'm actually adjudicating. You know, it's, it's, that was awful. <laughs> well, there, there's, there, there was a, a, a funny um, a, a incident that occurred, a, a section at Musselboro one year when Rosemary Wright was the, uh, the adjudicator. And, uh, and I, was, I was there with the sort of trade stand, you know, just doing the uh, clink scales you know, advertising accordions and uh, sp speaking to Rosemary afterwards. And what had happened was there had been about 40 people had played the test piece, uh, this, this test piece, the, the Humoresque by Dvorak. Oh, yeah. Uh, you know, the better, 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 better. Yeah. And, she, and she said that, you know, when, when she was summing up at the end, you know, she said, well, 39 people got up, and um, and and have clearly never heard the original, you know. They 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 they've never listened to how it goes in its original form. There was only one person that had, that actually played the tune it was meant to be. So you've got all these people playing it like some sort of Strass Bay and playing it rapidly. And the and the one the one kid that did it, but but uh, did a did it, did, you know. And everybody's everybody's thinking, oh. That's, that's awful, you know, that, that can't be right. And of course, it, that was the one that won quite clearly because everything was, was, was as it should be rather than this, uh, you know, hammering through it. Um, so, I mean, you, you've, you've, you've now got two books. I've got the, I've actually got the red book over, over there. Um, I, I noticed that the, I mean, for example, if I just quickly get it. I mean, as if, you know, there wasn't enough notes in, in what you get is. We then, we then get book two, first tune, Miss Adrienne Farnan. And we've got even more notes per bar. <laughs> was that, was that the, the intention was to, you know, to, 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 to make them even more? Uh, sort of technical. No, it is, uh, absolutely not. No, the, the, no. The, the thing is, there. I mean, it was basically the 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 expose, if you wish. The can't remember the word for it. it the, the first section with a, a variation mm -hmm. behind it, and it was just it was just what I heard in my head. Yeah. I, I wasn't saying no. I wonder if I can put in you know, uh, very, very quick, you know, demi-semi quavers and uh, lots of heavy triplets. No, it was just uh, uh, what I, I heard, you know. Yes. I, I, the first two tunes I composed, I composed when I was 17 and it was a tribute to my teacher, Jim Money. Yeah. And my mum, my mum is Rita Duncan. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Jim Money was my teacher, as you know. And I, Graham Mitchell and I, before the 1977 uh, senior competition, he was hunting for tunes that no one else had played. Yes. 
and he'd made up his mind he was going to play Harry Scott of Freakham. That's the one that he wanted to play for his march. Mm -hmm. And we both thought it was a great tune, really wonderful tune. And so we were fixed on that and we were going through various Highland presidents and all that kind of thing. He says, no, everybody's playing that. And we, then we discussed the warrior of Percy and things like that. No, everyone's playing that. You know, it's very, very pernickety, Graham. You, everything had to be just right. And he, he knew his, his own mind, even at that young age, you know. Yep. I said, well, Graham, I've got a couple of tunes lying about that I, I composed, well, when I was in my teens. And I played them to him. And I, I gave him uh, uh, the music for him. I think I wrote them out and then he took them away. Now, very interestingly, well, that was Rita Duncan, the Strass yeah. yes. and uh, J Jim Money, the, the, the real, and mm. that was the year that, that he won in 77. Interestingly, the guy who won the senior Scottish, uh, you know, Duncan Black this year, put in a stupendous performance, and he played Jim Money for his reel. And I originally wrote it in A, and he played it in A and then modulated into B flat. Mm -hmm for the second rendition of it, which sounded absolutely brilliant. I, I would never have thought of doing that. And when I've, it's in my music book, it's in B flat. Yeah. And someone, I'd th it was either one of the Black Brothers or one of the Curry Brothers on one of their uh, LPs, they recorded uh, Rita Duncan and Jim Money, and they recorded it in B flat, Jim Money, which was most interesting because that was the relative major of um, Rita Duncan, which yeah. is uh, B minor. minor. Yeah. And, you know, I thought that was a really clever touch. So when I got it, when I um, made up the music books, I put it in B flat as well. So I've got them to thank, you know, for that one. Yeah. But then I didn't, uh, I didn't compose anything after the age of 17 until, you know, I dug these two tunes and then I, I got inspiration. Someone had stolen my Godini accordion out of this hotel that I had a, residen a residency in for five years. And I had to get a new one. So I, I bought a, a Honor, can't remember. It was a, a bog standard sort of Honor, well, a lovely tone. And I woke up one morning with a tune in my head and wrote it down. And then I wrote something. Then I wrote a, a French waltz for my daughter Adrian again. And that's on that LP I gave you, that ringing the changes. You'll hear that on there. Um, and then I, I just couldn't stop writing tunes. They were keeping coming in my head. I, I was trapped in a, a car jam on Anderson Drive in, Ander, uh, uh, in Aberdeen. I wrote five tunes there on <laughs> scrap bits of paper out of my, my briefcase. Yeah. And, you know, I, I couldn't stop writing tunes. And that's sort of where I got started, really. Yeah. And then I got this classic, I bought a classic accordion from John Huben. That was one of the originals back in 79 or 78, something like that. And I, I got inspiration from that, that accordion too. And, you know, I started writing even more. So, and then I had a, a big lull but in the last good few years, last five years, and I started writing piles of stuff as well. So that's that's about where I am with the music stuff, anyway. It's, it's as funny. I mentioned, sorry, sorry so no, no, you, you carry on. As I said to you, there's lots of my pieces that are played that are not in my music. Mm -hmm. My I've taught them to my pupils, and then people listen to them, and people copy them, and this kind of yeah. thing, you know. So that's what happens. Yeah, you know, it's just I was having a conversation with uh, somebody the, the other night about. Um, my uh, particularly enjoyed um, working at uh, arrangements and originals, but particularly arrangements by uh, Charles Magnanti, because for me, it it whatever was was difficult, there was there was some sort of product at the end of it. You know, you weren't just doing it, you weren't just struggling with this this section just because he decided to make it difficult. There there was a there was a reason for it, you know? And and as as you as you quite rightly said, you know, you don't just put the notes there just to just to just to fill the bar, you know, they, they they've all got something to say, haven't they? You know? I think so. Basically any of these tunes that I have that have got variations, I just I'm just following the 
the, the harmonic progression. Mm -hmm. that, that, that's it. And, you know, I don't uh, think, ah, oh, well, what I'll do is I'll make this more difficult than that guy's tune. That, that, that's, I don't think that's how it works. I think that these tunes are gifts that you get. You know, yeah. It, yeah. interestingly, we were, talking about, we were talking about Graham Mitchell. And when I was teaching him, he came in this time. He said, I've written some tunes. Would you like to listen to them? And I said, well, I'd be quite delighted. And one of the, the ones that he, he played to me was a tune called Donny the Post. That was the local postman, as, as I understand it. And another one I think he played at that time, it was on this, it, during the same lesson, was I think it was called Randall's Reel. Yeah. And I thought they were an absolute knockout. And I said that to him. I said, Graham, I think they're absolutely fantastic. You know, and now I wonder where he got those from. Mm. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> I think that you just get them. You'll know that yourself, Paul. You know, well, they, they just come to you. I, when, when I started back in 2010, um, I, I entered Perth, and I think I ended and entered the the, um, the the senior and the veteran section, but I also did the polka and the musette section. And the, oh, yeah. the, the only thing I managed to get placed in was the, I got second in the, it was like the polka section with, uh, Charles Magnante's Accordiana, but then then I I got to the stage where I did actually start writing writing my own tunes, and I, I've managed to, to to win a couple of times using um, like my own French musette tunes that I'd written. You know, so yeah, oh, I, I used to, I used to compete every year in the own composition, and I managed to to win the first time it was with it with a reel called the Bourgeois Barnstormer. <laughs> <laughs> and then, and then, the, and then the second one was uh, I wrote this tune called Place de Renal, but it uses all the all, all, just about every sort of um, typical French musette theme you can think of. You know, it, they're they're all there. You know, um, and uh, yeah, that that was that, that that was good fun. But you know, the um, I, I think the comment was along the lines of you know some some interesting harmonies that were going on there. You know. Um, so yeah, the the, the 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 composing very similar to yourself. So sometimes you'd have a, a like a surge of of ideas, um, you know. Um, but I don't know about you. If if if, if I've written a tune, I'll, I'll write it down. But but I need to live with it for at least a couple of weeks until I'm fully happy with with how it's sounding. I have to keep keep making little adjustments to it. Yeah, yeah I, I, I do that too. I, I keep getting uh, pipe tunes coming in my head because that was uh, another thing that I taught my pupils too, you know, the, the pipe style. Yeah. And, you know, teaching them the proper way to play pipe stuff. And lots and lots of uh, players, uh, they, they, pay, they play sometimes uh, staccato passages in the pipe tunes. And in my ignorance, really just listening to pipers and that, I, I think that they've got to be very legato. Yeah. And you've got to make sure that your tempi are absolutely, you know, uh, on, the, on the button. For example, the reel has never, ever got to be played like a violin reel. And, you know, when you're going from the march into the Strass Bay, it's got to be almost imperceptible. It just flows into the Strass Bay. So the march flows and the, 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 uh, the, the people who adjudicate that are absolutely cracking on pipe music. They know exactly what they want to hear. And it doesn't matter how good an accordion player, if your style isn't correct with the, the grace notes and you know, the, 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 the correct way of playing, you, know, you, don't, you don't normally do too well in these competitions, regardless yeah. how well technically you could play, you know? Yeah. Is, is it, have I heard this correctly, that there was famously once in one of the competitions, um, a, a pipe section. Somebody had transposed one of the one of the tunes to F major and was instantly disqualified. <laughs> <laughs> or play a G sharp or something like that. Oh, oh yeah, <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> and, it's, and it's and it's funny, isn't it? How how you know, like if you if you, if you were playing at like a two four pipe march set of marches, say in an accordion club, you would typically finish with a chord, but. Pipes don't play chords. <laughs> they absolutely don't. Uh. No, they absolutely don't. But I mean, the thing is that, you know, you're with your length of experience and that all these things uh, would come naturally to you. But if you were trying to pick up one of these pipe books and look at them and know how they should sound, it must be very, very difficult unless you have a bit of guidance, really. Yeah. yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm yet to be convinced that the pipers actually put in 
all of those individual single grace notes before each note. I'm, I, I'm yet to be, I would have to have it slowed right down to actually hear every <laughs> single note there. You know, it's, uh, but I get it. I, I get it. it it's, it's just a, a code for what, what type of, um, uh, you know, uh, grace note embellishment to put in before a certain notes. And of course they have to, don't they? They have to sometimes put in um, a grace note because it's it's you, you they, they cannot repeat the same note can they you know they can't well, go to a, sort of an a and then replay it because it's constant sound well exactly exactly in in my ignorance i i i'm, I'm not saying you're wrong of course I, I would naturally agree with you there and i i don't know enough about technique but all these is it to lures and that kind of thing that they they they, they play is that one of the sort of things there was actually a very very good uh article I read, it was this chap, I think he teaches at um, the Royal Academy in Glasgow because they do uh, uh, traditional music courses uh, and he would sort of say, if you see this in a, a pipe score, uh, this kind of uh, grace note, this is, this is the sort of equivalent that you would do in accordion. I found that really, really clever. And I can't remember who the, the, the chap is. He's obviously one of the, the head tutors at, at the academy there. But someone did pass this on to me during a lesson. He said, mm -hmm. have you seen this? And th that was very useful. And it'd be a really good guide to people to help them understand, you know? Absolutely, yeah. I, I, <laughs> the one thing I always remember learning about Grace Notes was a, was a session musician that was a well-known saxophonist in the 60s in London who was a, a local uh, musician, played saxophone, and and pipes up at the up at the Carter Bar there, and I remember him once telling me, if if you ever want, want to make music sound country, just 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 put in put, put in you know um, instead of a, a semitone architecture, make it a full tone. Oh yeah, and immediately yeah. immediately you make it sound sound country and western, and, and he was absolutely spot on. You know, it's, uh, um, I, 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 obviously you've been following the. Um, the, the Perth Festival, for example, and, and obviously Musselburgh for a long, long time. The, the numbers of competitors is declining every year. And any thoughts on why that, why that is? Well, I, I think um, it's the competition that young children have now. For example, if you give a child a mobile phone at the age of uh, six, seven, eight, I don't know, Maybe, maybe they get them before that. These children are already um, conditioned to want to have instant gratification. You know, you can, they, they'll be able to have any kind of information that they wish, governed, of course, by their, their parents' choice. But, and they, they'll have all these sort of uh, shoot them up games and this kind of thing where you're killing people and winning and this kind of thing. I mean, you compare the fun that you've got looking at this the, the lovely coloured screen that's making you feel happy and sitting in your room on your own for an hour with uh, no feedback, your hands are freezing. You're saying, why am I doing this? You know, now, go figure. That's, that's, that's the first thing I would say. Plus, there's, there's too much competition, you know, for people's... Um, uh, appetites and you know people's wants now I, I think I think that would be the basic thing plus the the what we have to do in accordion circles and Scottish circles and any kind of thing is to foster this so we've got to recapture these children I, I don't really know the secret to doing it perhaps it's the the, the real idea I was teaching his you'll never guess his name his name's James Shand <laughs> 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 And it, it, his mum phoned me up and anyway, it, it, I was teaching him. He heard his teacher at school playing the accordion because he didn't have a piano. And he came home to his mum at the age of five and said, mum, I want to play the accordion. Now, just something like that, something as random as that. And that laddie is now captured. He wants to be a box player, you know, and it's, it's very difficult. I, I, I don't know the answer to that, Paul. It's, it's too complex. One thing that would put uh, uh, children off as well is listening to the senior class, uh, the senior um, traditional section, listening to all you guys playing and saying, God almighty, how long is it going to take me to be able to play like that? You know, but uh, anyway, 
I, I don't really know. One great thing I think that's going on is you've got, is it TMSA, the Tamsa people that do the traditional things. You've got feshes. You, uh, competitions, local competitions are fantastic because as we both know, you get competitive players. There's people who want to play. There's mm -hmm. people who want to win, just like all human beings, you know? Yeah. You get other people who are more kuthi. They just want to play and love the music and this kind of thing. But I think festivals are good. Give uh, children focus, make them technically more um, more accurate and this kind of thing. So uh, I, I think naturally coming from my background, I think that festivals, competitions and this kind of thing are good. Plus you've got the Strathspey and Real Societies, you've got the box, what was it they call them, the, the box and fiddle? No, what's, what's the yes. local groups you go to? The Accordion, fiddle. Fiddle. Accordion Fiddle Club. Yeah. Accordion and Fiddle Clubs, yeah. Yes. And that kind of, so that, that, was, that was great, that was inspirational. My, my pupils uh, back in the day would say, I want to go and see this because they've got uh, the Bill Black Band and I, yeah. I've been listening to his LP and oh, we've got uh, this wonderful band coming up from the South and this kind of thing. And, you know, this guy's going to come and Gordon Patillo's coming up and he does things on his own with electric accordion. That's inspirational to young musicians, I think. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it, 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 I don't know, you can, can maybe help me with this because I never ever had time to go to box and fiddle meetings apart from once about uh, four or five years ago when Graham Mitchell was the guest artist and I had time off before I played a snooker match and went in to see him. And <clears throat> how well do they do now, the accordion and fiddle clubs? Are, are they well attended, that kind of thing? Well, uh, some, some are doing very well. Um because they do um, manage to, to grow the number of people that attend. It's been a while since I was at Peebles, but I'm, for example, um, I remember one time going along and they were struggling to get people in. And now all of a sudden they, they're, you know, they're picking up a lot of more. Last night I was at Kelso. It's, it's a big yeah. room. It's a big room that they're in and they have a, they have a good turnout. Um, but then others, others have, have, have really struggled to, to, you know, to, to keep going. Um, how many, I, how, many, how many youngsters go, though? That's the important thing. Not very many, I must admit. That is, that is one of the problems. You, you don't get yeah. very many going to these, uh, uh, the, the, the youngsters. Um, but, you know, remember when uh, there was a Klingscales music shop in Aberdeen? Yes. Yeah, and they, Klingscales also had Jimmy and Steve. They opened up in, uh, I believe it's Mulgai. It was in Glasgow, oh, yes. and obviously they uh -huh. had the, they had the two shops um, side by side, more or less, in Melrose. When, okay. when when I first moved up in 1983, Clinkscales were the fourth largest retailer of Yamaha organs in the UK. Incredible, incredible, you know, and absolutely incredible, yeah. And 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 within, I would say, in, in less than. In less than four years, I went to a seminar in Falkirk, hosted by the demonstrator Glyn Madden, and he and he said he said, within the next eighteen months, the organ market will be dead. The electric piano is going to take over. And guess what happened? Well, the ele well the electric piano. Was, well, or or. Could it not be as well the the keyboard in inverted oh, yes, commas? That, exactly. Keyboards came in, you yeah. know, with, with all these Kenneth Baker books and this yeah. kind of thing. I used to teach lots of keyboard yeah. pupils, yeah. and that that really took uh, took off at, uh, during the eighties. That was uh, phenomenally successful, you know, uh, playing uh, electronics, you know, with the the built in accompaniment with mm -hmm. your left hand. It was fantastic, you know, yep, yep, yep. far easier than playing the piano, essentially. Well, you know, in, in, in that room, you know, we were all staff from Clink Sales and, and uh, one or two other shops, and we all kind of looked at one another as if, is he being serious, you know, because he's a he's a top organ demonstrator, you know, it's he's saying that his whole world is gonna gonna come tumbling down, you know, no more organs. And, and sure enough, you you you've you very, very rarely have I've I've got two pupils that have got older Yamaha HS organs. And, and it was just the fact that we, we couldn't find a keyboard at the price suitable. That, you know, they, they go for, yep. for really low money. Um, but, but, but the interesting thing is, and, and, and we, I often talk to uh, one or two of the sort of teachers that, that uh, 
I remember going to Perth one year. The first year I ever met Alistair Gillespie, he'd he turned up with um, three coach loads of accordionists at the competitions. You know, you'd got Bill, Bill, Bill Sharp, um, was it Gene Brown too in um, Glasgow? You know, you'd got all these all these teachers turning up with coach loads of kids and and, and, and adults. You know, but. You know, as I say, you'd have like in the traditional solo section, you'd have like eighty odd competitors. <laughs> you know, and, um, and 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 you think now, why why has it why has it suddenly gone? You know, just kept falling lower and lower and lower in numbers. I think I think you're absolutely right when it comes to the the if you like the traditional section. You know, the the open solo. I think the fact is that there are. Um, less and less people who are able to cope with the demands of playing tunes that, 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 that they're, they're going to have any chance of winning with. I think I think that is a that is a uh, a, a factor because when you look back to you know I remember speaking with John Carmichael. I, I think he said he won it in '69, um, and it was it was it was the the standard March Strass spades spades and reels that that he did then. There there was none of these, um, you know, the the accordionists weren't using Scott Skinner. Peter Farnan hadn't done his his Scottish music book yet, you know. So so that that really up up the the bar, didn't it, you know? Yes. But here's here's the other other thought about it, and and that is that um, the Associated Board of the Royal Schools of Music, I've, 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 I've memorised these figures. Do you, you know, they do exams in 93 different countries. Well, I knew that, I knew that they, they were worldwide. Yes. I didn't yep, know it was yep, yep. but I didn't know it was 93. No. And, 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 they, and the syllabus, they've got syllabus for around about 30 different instruments. Okay. All, all the brass, all the woodwind, all the strings, piano, guard, guitar, etc. you know. And so per year, per year, the associated board do over 600,000 exams. Unbelievable. I know. <laughs> and, and, and did you know, did you know that, that more than half are piano? The piano, number of people doing piano exams outnumbers every, every all the other instruments put together. It just shows yep. you how uh, the, the, the piano has become this sort of like, well, I, th- I think it's always been considered an important instrument, but but nowadays, the, the, speaking with um, with other teachers, I, I know, for example, that um, speaking with Alistair, I remember Alistair Gillespie, I remember him saying, you know, he's, he's, he's down to about half a dozen accordion pupils, but a day full of piano pupils. Same, same yeah. as... Same with Keith over in in, in bigger as well, you know. Um, I, I don't know if, if did you did you find that, you know, that there's dare I say that there's almost a snobbery about the piano, you know. As well, the it, thing uh, is that you know, if if you wish, uh, orchestral musicians, a lot of them are, are very snobbish. They they don't consider it the uh, accordion to be a natural mm-hmm. instrument because it's constructed out of plastic and bits of wood and bits of metal and goodness only knows where you get a nice pure clarinet that's made out used to be made out of african black wood and yes. th- these kind of things you know it, it's very easy to look down on the accordion but if you hear some of these you and i both know some of these free bass box players are terrifying yes. absolutely frightening I'll, I'll give you a very quick one talking about teaching uh, I uh, have also taught uh, continental chromatic and never having played it, I got this book uh, to try and learn the, the fingering system. You know, now naturally chromatic is very, very simple because you're going up in threes, yeah. you know, d- fine. And then I tried to understand what they were saying about the fingering and I couldn't make head nor tail of it. So this guy would come to me, Bob from up north. I worked out what the the fingering for a major scale would be and um, a harmonic and melodic minor scale would be and that's all you really need as far as I was concerned you know arpeggios took care of themselves really and I used to do that by just um, when he played it and I looked at the music I could tell whether he was playing it properly or not so that wasn't the problem but it was to try and get him a comfortable fingering system but at the point I'm coming to is free bass that that was just a normal uh, Stradella uh, basses, but then this this girl, her name was es- Esme Mitchell. It's in, in, engraved on my uh, on my forehead. Really, she had a Bayan Russian uh, box 
and this uh, had free bass, and also she played it upside down. She played the, the, the free bass side with her right hand and the actual treble buttons with her left hand. Now you can imagine a guy who doesn't know anything about free bass trying to teach someone that. That was, that was real fun. As I say, it's, it's quite simple to know whether she's playing it or not, but she'd have to tell me where the notes were, you see? And then I would say, well, I wouldn't do it with these fingers. So it was a, a learning experience uh, for both of us, really. But that was the most uh, frightening uh, teaching experience I've ever had in my life. <laughs> yeah, I, I've, I've always had this, um, if, if you like, this, this theory that, that when it comes to um, our sort of, um, from our caveman days, when we first discovered that you can twang a, a, a bit of gut and it makes a sound and, you know, you've got all your stringed instruments dating from there and your percussion when, you, you know, the first caveman banged, you know, banged his club against something, you know. So, so you know, stringed instruments, uh, drummers, you know, they, 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 they go back to Neanderthal times. But, you know, it's like man has constantly striven to, to produce the perfect instrument. Since the accordion yep. was invented, there hasn't been anything acoustic instrument invented since the accordion. Why? Because it's perfect. So I've, I've always, <laughs> I've always been a bit, <laughs> bit sort of, you know, uh, yeah. All these other instruments are good, but but there, there's only one that's that's actually perfect. That, that you know, we spent you know um, thousands and thousands of years, mankind trying to develop the, the, the perfect thing. There you go. It's called an accordion. <laughs> I wouldn't disagree with that at all. No, 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 no. I wouldn't disagree with that. No. Although I spent most of my playing career was never on accordion, really. It was on bass. Yes. You know, I did all of my stuff on uh, bass, really, you know, and uh, that took up all my playing from about the age of, apart from taking it out occasionally when I did that with that pickup band, we used to do functions, weddings. I would take it out and do standard sort of strip the willows and eights and reels and this kind of thing and Scottish waltzes. It was all sort of playing in rock bands, pop bands, big bands, jazz bands, all this kind of thing on bass. You know, so I missed out in my development on the accordion because I stopped practicing it basically when I was about 17, when I started playing bass, you know. But I was very fortunate because I came up to Aberdeen at the beginning of the oil boom. That was the end of the 60s, you know, and mm. uh, the amount of money going about Aberdeen, there was, I would suggest in Aberdeen, you would have at least 20 pubs that had a four piece band in them, if not more. And they were getting at least three or four nights a week employment. So mm. it was a, a hive of great musicians. And that was it. It was a wonderful place to play. And I also got into the Grampian TV. I was a session bass player with them for years as well, before they actually packed up. It was about 20 years I did sessions for them. So really fortunate in Aberdeen, really good. Excellent, yeah. Um, Peter, I'm gonna let you go because we've uh, we've gone on for well over an hour. <laughs> <laughs> Doesn't time fly, eh? Um, but, but, you know, um, are, you, um, uh, are you kind of happy with the idea of, you know, as, as for example, I've, as you said, I, I took your Adrian Fan and your uh, view from women and, and added even more. Is, is, is that something you're comfortable with? It, is, is that the sort of way forward or is, is there a point, is there a point when you, you, you don't really want to make it any more complicated? Well, you see, the thing is that uh, people who are uh, slaves to idiom would say that you are embellishing it too much. Mm. You know, I don't think so. I think it's a great compliment because some of your harmonies are, are I would suggest, uh, better than mine, more melodic than mine. I, I don't mind saying that uh, at all. And but it's it's the thing is that if you're adjudicating a competition, there's eventually a limit to which they say now. See, you're using very advanced harmonies. I make absolutely sure I only use sort of majors, minors, diminished. This kind of thing, you know, I, I don't want to do altered chords at all. Mm. But, you know, for a lot of the other stuff that I write, I do do. Mm -hmm. But not, not for not for these traditional things. I try and keep them more pure. But the, the, I, I take it a great, as a great compliment that you're actually going out of your way to embellish these things and make them sound the way that you would like to, mm -hmm. you know, play them. I think that's marvellous. But as I say, from a, a, an adjudicator's point of view, 
they may say, well, it's fantastic playing, but is, is it, you know, maybe slightly complicated by these very impressive harmonies? I don't know. I hope you don't find that insulting. But, no, know. not at all. I, 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 just, I just find it interesting when you, uh, you know, I remember when um, Robert Black um, won Perth, I think it would have been about... Um, 2012 2013 and, and he used all his own own tunes and he was yep. you know doing doing like sort of left hand runs and 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 you know putting in harmonies you know yep. you know in, in, the, in the right hand and 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 i remember i i saw this video a youtube video and one of the comments was I didn't. I didn't. I didn't think this was the classical section. I thought this was the solo, senior solo. You know, and and, and I, I get I get the sense that there's there there's um that there's two factions here. That there's for want of the word better word the traditionalists that, that that would be happy if you play you know your your Scott Skinner or um you know um your your, your sort of well known. March Strass Bay's real and and you know put, put in one or two variations but you know nothing nothing too much and that the, the, on, the, on the other hand you've got so you've got traditionalists and I I would say you've got the, the sort of modernists you know that, that are looking to you know sort of sort of push the boundaries as, as far as they possibly can um and and and, and, I, and I get the sense that there is this um conflict going on within the uh you know, particularly with the adjudicators, you know, some some are very much sort of, you know, or oh, we want it to be traditional. You know, I mean, I don't know if you've ever heard heard the heard this, the comment, you know, of um, uh, just a general one when somebody will say about a um, somebody's played a March Strass Bay Real, well, you couldn't have danced to that. <laughs> you know? it's, it's, like, it's like, for goodness' sake, you know, if if you, you know, you've got your pipe section, which for me is where you do your your sort of very traditional stuff and for me the open solo although obviously it was jimmy shan that first started the section off i i think he would be he would be wanting this this sort of constant development of of the section you know to, to the to the extent where you know we we do have um you know <laughs> the, the, the you know the, the craig paintings the robert blacks put in you know all sorts of uh you know wonderful harmonies and uh you know really stretching the stretching the keyboard as it were you know yeah i i agree with that i mean the, the, in my sort of uh, uh experience you had that the, the traditionalists and the purists thought that uh, my stuff was uh muck i remember what was his name god rest his soul um a, a fine band leader anyway at that meeting he turned around to me and said by the way I don't like any of your music. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I took that as a great compliment, actually. <laughs> but um, I can't remember <coughs> Bobby Crow. Bobby right. Crow. Yeah. Now that he's very unfortunately passed on. But I had the utmost respect for Bobby Crow. Great player, great band. And, you know, we could live beside each other. He hated my music, but I, I loved playing in his traditional style, you know, and playing the tunes that he would play. For example, none of these Craig Paytons or uh, any of these great players, the Blacks, and you name them all, you know, the Liam Stewart's and all that kind of, they would never dream of doing a, a broadcast for the, the Scottish dance music stuff, playing all that kind of stuff that yes. they, they would do it at a competition. That's, mm. that's the actual, that's the dichotomy, if you wish. There. Yes. You know, you've got the separation here between what you actually have to do to mm -hmm. do uh, Scottish country dancing and what you do to demonstrate your qualities as a soloist. Mm -hmm. I, th I think you could possibly uh, draw a line by saying that. And you're quite right about the pipe section that I'd mentioned before about the, 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 the you must play, you know, the pipe music as simply and as properly as, as possible, really. Anything in, to embellish that music just would work, really. Apart from, of course, uh, carefully chosen grace notes, I think. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I must admit, I, I, maybe this is, this is a bit cruel, but I, I sometimes get an impression that some of these traditionists would be quite happy if, if in a solo, senior solo, it was it was a, it was a test piece March Strass Bay Reel. You know, every year you had to play a certain March Strass Bay and Reel, and that way you could you could just you know it would be easier to to adjudicate, wouldn't it? You know, if everybody was playing the same March Strass Bay Reel, you know. Um, I, I, yeah, I, I agree. But human human nature it, it means that we always 
uh, become more creative. We always move onwards. Yeah. There are people who are not happy. I mean, what have we got now? Uh, for a uh, hundred odd years, we've had, um, you know, combustion engines. Now we've yes. got uh, electric engines and motor cars. Yeah. Now, the human race doesn't sit still. No. I mean, you've got all these geniuses that invent computers. Uh, goodness knows, I, I won't state the obvious, but th th that's the nature of, of human beings. We always mm. want them to, to, to do different things, you know? Yeah, yes. Well, um, I'm going to... Um say cheerio i many thanks for sending the the first book as i say i i've got this uh, an original copy of the uh, of book two which um yeah. which was uh it's stamped um clingscore music sent 117 rosemate place aberdeen price it? it priced at five pound fifty i'll tell you what you wouldn't be able oh, to get that for five fifty anymore <laughs> I was going to say, are we still recording at the moment? Oh, yes. Yep. No, no, but uh, I, I just want to make sure that I'm free is to, to speak to you. And, you know, and if we're still recording, that's uh, that's that's OK, because this is going to be a heck of a long... Uh, how long are your shows normally, Paul? I, I didn't know. The um, Usually about half an hour, 45 minutes, but sometimes oh, an hour. I, I mean, we're, we're up to about an hour and a quarter now. So so that's, that's good. I mean, it's... Uh, you know, <laughs> people can always watch some of it on YouTube, and then then YouTube automatically knows where you got to, so you can come oh, back see. back to it again and pick it up from the point where you stopped. Ah, okay. Yeah. Uh, I didn't. I didn't. Uh, having done this for the first time this week, yeah. I didn't really understand how you went about doing all your processing and that. Well, what I, what I'll do is is I'll say sort of officially cheerio and stop the recording, and then and then say say cheerio. Um, <laughs> off, off screen as it were so so here we go uh stop